to the amount of information you could process per minute. Yeah, that's what I, what I call second order uh, fine, yeah. information. Well, I think you have another point to make. Well, maybe. <laughs> uh, but this is not on the question of artificial intelligence. I think that Professor Papert, what Professor Papert said is, is of course right. Is I was identifying too much the question of uh, whether we are Turing machines and the question whether we're computers. And what you're saying is that in a real sense, computers aren't Turing machines. Right. The um, other point I want to make is this. Um, most of what I said today, not all of it, is going to appear in an article in Cognition, by the way. Uh, that's a plug for <laughs> Cognition, which is a new psychological journal. The um, one point is this, that I think there's a sense in which what we've, all of us have been saying overlooks something very important, which is that if one is talking about actual human functioning in a social context, then it may well be that none of these psychological states is a brain state because none of them is a state of one person. I mean, let me give you a very simple example. Uh, suppose I am jealous of someone. I'm jealous of X's regard for Y. I wish X liked me instead of Y or whatever. Um, now, I would not be in the state of being jealous of X's regard for Y if X and Y didn't exist. Might be in the state of hallucinating. <laughs> that I was jealous of X's regard for Y, but it wouldn't be in the state of being jealous of X's regard for Y. In that trivial way, some of the things we call psychological states are states of systems larger than just one person. But there's an even deeper um, problem there. Suppose X and Y didn't exist. You'd say, well, you could still be jealous of X's regard for Y in, let's say, a new hyphenated sense. We bracket whether X and Y really exist we simply say, well, at least you are in a state we might call jealousy, although it's not now the ordinary language notion of jealousy, which certainly implies the existence of the person you're jealous of. And I say, oh, well, what would that be? And you might say, well, just being, uh, having these, if you were philosophically naive and so on, hadn't read Wittgenstein, you might say, well, you know, you have maybe these feelings these surges of emotion accompanied by these visual images, that's being jealous of X's regard for Y. Now, Wittgenstein pointed out in the investigations, I think fairly conclusively, that for any story like that, you know, if you change the context, you can tell a story about someone who has those images, even those surges of emotion, and has quite a different meaning. It would not be correctly described as his being jealous of X's regard for Y. And I think that Wittgenstein's point can be extended from just images. And, I mean, Wittgenstein's point is generally these mental predicates are not just about phenomenal occurrences. Although the empiricist tradition in philosophy, not the continental tradition, but the empiricist tradition has always thought they were just reducible to phenomenal occurrences. But I think they're also not reducible to brain state talk or programming talk. I think in general, that was the assumption that we have a fixed repertoire of emotions and attitudes, independent of the society we're in, seems to me just plain wrong. It seems to be quite clear that there are emotions and attitudes we have, like appreciation of an abstract theory, which were not in the repertoire of the human race at one time. And there may well be emotions and attitudes in the repertoire of an Arunha, which are not in the repertoire of any of us, that is, we've lost as well as gained. Now, that means that a full-fledged psychological theory, you know, maybe have to be interdependent with social theories in a very complicated way. I mention that because I think the, one has to realize that I think when we are talking about multi-purpose heuristics of this sort that uh, Professor Papert and I have been discussing, I think we're talking within a legitimate, important idealization, but an idealization. I mean, the fact is that whatever we are socialized, we have socially acquired, socially evolved programs. But we've only been able to program ourselves or be programmed by others 
you know, because we have an innate program that enables us to do that. There is a biologically innate program which is presupposed by the social programs. So you see, the problem of AI and also the problem Chomsky is dealing with, the problem many people are dealing with, is the problem of saying something about the innate program, the program that a child or a chimpanzee you know, brings to these cognitive tasks. That's an important idealization, right? I mean, we can abstract from culture, say, after all, there is something which every normal human being, when small, brings to his culture, no matter whichever it is. And we can ask for a model of that. But I think the problem of separating out the innate structure of cognition from the structure of cognition in a rich, and not to say emotion, in a rich social context, have to be separated. Well, of course, it might have been there when I was born, but there mightn't be any left now. <laughs> um, there are a number of points that I might have been tempted to follow up, but the hour is late, and I think perhaps I'll be very brief. Um, the question of um, whether wholes are greater than some of parts, I think, shouldn't be left uh, as if it were a matter of preference for slogans. If uh, Galileo and Aristotle had been doing their experiments in treacle instead of in free air, then indeed it would have made a difference to split the thing and uh, uh, the two smaller bodies wouldn't have fallen at the same rate as the um, large body. Uh, so that um, the question whether in a perceptual situation you have to expect qualitatively different behavior for a whole from what you would deduce by summing the responses to the parts. Uh, this is always an empirical question, and there are any number of special purpose uh, elements in the brain that do uh, respond to the whole in a different way from the sum of the individual responses to the parts. Uh, basically, the question is whether the uh, network is an additive one or whether it's multiplicative. As soon as it's multiplicative, then obviously the, uh, the whole has a different selective effect. I don't think. Uh, Papert would deny that. I just wanted to be sure that we didn't get the feeling that, um, as it were, the way, the way forward in AI would always be to try and reduce things to a summative model, uh, a cross-correlation model, where, in, es in essence, you're multiplying the effect of simultaneously present stimuli. Um, seems for most uh, pattern recognition jobs the more likely Bet. And this is one of the attractions, of course, of um, uh, hardware, that you can engineer, for instance, an artificial eye with uh, a million parallel channels and have these operating uh, in a multiplicative mode simultaneously, so that although, in principle, you could program this in a serial digital computer, as both speakers have pointed out, this might take an astronomically longer time to simulate. Um, I think probably in view of the time, I should just make one um, concluding point. What I think is striking about uh, our afternoon and evening is the extent to which we've found ourselves in agreement. Um, none of us has suggested that mechanistic understanding of mental processes in the sense that's been explicated uh, has any logical tendency to debunk the traditional significance attached to our uh, human mental activity, our responsibility, or if we are prepared to take it seriously, um, to debunk the concept of the immortality of the soul in the Judaic, uh, Christian, theistic form at least. I think this is significant because there's a good deal of second-rate popular journalism which gives the impression that people on the one hand, uh, like Papert, who work in artificial intelligence, and people like myself on the other in brain research, are a kind of menace. You have to keep an eye on these chaps. You never know what they'll produce next, and soon we'll be nothing but machines. I think if one thing has emerged clearly, it's that none of us here regard this as a rational inference to draw from the progress of me mechanistic uh, science, either of the artificial or natural intelligence. And uh, if I may hark back to the first point Papert made, the reason why I at least 
deliberately spoke as if brain science had the links between the eye story and the brain story, and as if uh, computer scientists would be one day able to do this, that, and the other at will, was not indeed to pretend that that's a foreseeable state of the art, but just because if we're trying to get a philosophical point clear, then it's best, I think, to go to the extreme form, ask what if we reached this extreme of competence, what would then follow? And if what would then follow is innocuous to human dignity and human responsibility for human action and so on, then a fortiori, given the limits to which Papert rightly draws attention, uh, it's quite mistaken for anyone to imply or infer that progress in artificial or natural, uh, in the understanding of either artificial or natural intelligence, is in any way inimical to the values which are characteristically human, uh, either moral or religious. I must disagree with that violently. <laughs> uh, I mean, the fact that I didn't think it was worth raising doesn't mean to say that I assent. It seems to me that while you might have shown that a certain state of affairs which you describe could be consistent with continuing in your view of yourself and of your relation to man and God and the rest, it doesn't follow that that would be the case. It doesn't follow that people would necessarily subscribe to your logic, for example, and and despite your argument that took more steps than most people usually go along with in, in important decisions of policy, you know, they might still have, people might, not, might still consider that if we had machines, for example, that could do everything that people can do much better, that this might be considered as an affront to human dignity. And people might be very unhappy about the fact that, that although uh, you might be able to play being philosopher, if one really wanted to get the best argument, one would go and ask the machine. Or if one really wanted to get the best diagnosis, which is something that is even closer to, to your medical problems, you would go and ask the computer. And I do th yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think this is important, you see. What you're saying is that even though it were irrational, people might come to this conclusion. I they didn't deny that. Happy and they might change their I, I didn't... Uh, I but didn't, that makes it dangerous. I didn't deny that um, people might draw irrational conclusions. What I said was <laughs> that we should recognize that such conclusions are irrational, that it does not follow from mechanistic explication or mechanistic uh, imitation of human performance uh, that uh, the personality and its moral and spiritual significance is debunked. Uh, if Papert is saying that in spite of this fact there are irrational people who will uh, draw false conclusions, uh, then my answer is so what? And when he says that there might be a machine which was able to answer questions better than I, uh, I'm prepared for the sake of argument to suppose that there is one and that there it is inside that head. And it's the, the, the complete fallacy of imagining that this should reduce my respect for that individual just because what's inside that head is a machine, I think shows the nonsense of imagining that if people could produce such machines artificially, one would have any rational grounds for respecting the resulting person any less. But as I think we all agreed, this is science fiction when we talk about reproducing, and it was Papert who admonished me for giving as much credence to the possibility. So we're not basically disagreed on that. Uh, all I'm saying is, let us be clear that it's only by wishful thinking or wishful unthinking that anyone can make developments of art in artificial intelligence into a pretext for reducing their uh, respect for their fellow human beings.